Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. How hard it must have been for John the Baptist and his followers when he was imprisoned for speaking the truth. And as his days of public preparation for the Messiah came to such a persecuted end. John was appointed as the forerunner to come before the Lord and prepare his way, so that when he would arrive, his people would be ready for his kingdom. And John did what he was raised up to do. He exhorted the people of God to repent of their sins, to wait upon the Lord for the fulfillment of his promises. He reminded them that one greater than himself would come, and with this one the kingdom of God would enter the world. Like so many before him, John waited patiently for God to fulfill his word. He desired, like all the prophets, to see the Lord's righteousness in his kingdom. And eventually, that kingdom would come in Christ. And when it did, John knew that his work, the calling to be the forerunner, would come to an end. That's why he would say of the Christ, This joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. And decrease he did, for he could not eclipse the work of the one whose way he came to prepare. Like the whole people of God, John was ready to receive God's kingdom. The only thing is, all was not as it may have seemed for John. And this was especially true for those who had followed John and had heard his message. In the Old Testament reading for today, the prophet Isaiah foretells what the John's message is going to be like. The forerunner would proclaim these words. He would say, Behold, this is your God. That is, God and his kingdom is now with you. And the kingdom which John and Isaiah referred to, it was to be understood in these terms. That the Lord God comes with his arm and his might. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. When the Lord would come, it would be a mighty and great day. John himself proclaimed this when of the Messiah he said, His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather the wheat into the barn, but the chafe he will burn with unquenchable fire. What John proclaims is true. But what happens when what God says about himself doesn't occur in the way or the timing in which we think it should? How confused must the followers of John have been when he was locked away in prison just waiting to be beheaded? The kingdom of God has come, and yet here John rests, awaiting his death. If the kingdom of God is going to be so mighty and so awesome when the Lord comes, as God testifies in his word, and if the Lord has come, as John has truthfully said, why is it that the kingdom of might, glory, and power looks so far away at this moment for John and his disciples? In some ways, the disciples of John go to Jesus to kind of ask this very same question. And so they ask for confirmation that the kingdom of God is here in the world in Jesus because it's not quite like they were expecting. And when they kind of ask Jesus about this, our Lord gives them a very specific response. He says, The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up. And the poor have good news preached to them. Jesus gives them exactly what they need to hear. He quotes from the prophet Isaiah where he records what it will be like when the kingdom of God comes in Christ. And all these things that Jesus reminds them of, they have taken place. 
In what more scriptural way can Jesus proclaim that he is the long-awaited Messiah? He is the one whose way John was sent to prepare. The only trouble is for the disciples, although Jesus has done all these things, his kingdom still isn't exactly what they were expecting. Where is all the might? How about all that stuff about the wheat and the chaff being burned? What is John doing in prison, waiting to be killed if the kingdom of God is at hand? Something seems to be seriously wrong. The disciples of John who come to Jesus, they are not the only ones who are tempted to misunderstand the nature of God's kingdom. They are not the only ones who are left at times in the sinful flesh to wonder, has the kingdom of God come at all? We too are subject to those kinds of doubts and those kinds of confusion. If God's kingdom has come, and if we belong to God's kingdom, why do we continue as his people to struggle with so much sin? If we live in the time of the church where Christ reigns in his kingdom, why does the church suffer so much persecution? Though we live as God's people in his kingdom, we still seem to be subject to so many trials, challenges, and tragedies. These aren't the kinds of things that we normally associate with the coming of God in His kingdom. We like to think that the kingdom of God is like a glorious place where there are no troubles, where we don't struggle with sin, and where happiness is the daily experience of God's people. We desire a kingdom of glory where there is no suffering and no cross to bear. But that is not the kind of kingdom that Jesus has come to bring yet. At the end of Jesus' response to the disciples of John, he sends them away with these parting words. Blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Jesus means to say that in him the kingdom of God has come. And John has proclaimed the right Savior. But for sinners who find themselves in all kinds of predicament, Jesus is trying to say that the sinner may not see Jesus as the kind of Savior that they want to look for. It's why so many in the church are frustrated by the kind of Savior that Jesus is and the kind of kingdom that he's brought into the world. Our sinful flesh, it desires a kingdom that offers worldly riches and possessions. The evil of our hearts wants a king who will make us powerful and lords over our neighbor instead of their servants. We want to belong to a kingdom that is loved by the world. But Christ's kingdom only seems to bring the world's wrath. If the kingdom of God has come with might and ark and the, uh, and, 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 and the might of God and the recompense of the Lord, why does his kingdom feel so lowly? Why is it so persecuted and despised? It might make you wonder if the might and the arm and the recompense of God have come at all. But the truth is, they have. The might the arm and the recompense of the Lord have come, but they have not yet come with the fire and the judgment with which they will so clearly appear at the end. Instead, they have come as the prophet Isaiah said they would in the Savior. For when he speaks of the Savior, he says this, He will tend his flock like a shepherd, and he will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. The kingdom of God has come in lowliness, binding up those who are crushed by sin. The Savior comes with good news, but it's not good news as the world understands good news. Rather, it is good news as God declares it. The Christ and His kingdom have come for sinners whose end would be death in sin so that they might have the fullness of life instead. This new life is about God's kingdom, not life in the world's kingdom. 
For in the kingdom of God there are many riches and many wonders to behold, but they are not the things of the world. In God's kingdom, there is forgiveness. The promise that for those who trust in Christ, there will be no guilt on the last day and no unquenchable fire to be feared. In the kingdom of God, there is the promise of the resurrection where the sting of death has no pain for us. For though we may die in the flesh, we will yet live, being raised up from the dead. In the kingdom of God here on earth, there is newness of life. For we have been called out of the sinful flesh into the new man, that the old might be drowned by daily contrition and repentance. And now we have been set free in the Lamb who has taken away our sins, not so that we will serve ourselves but rather so that we may serve our neighbor in love, just as he has so served us. This is the kingdom of God where Jesus gathers his people like a shepherd gathers his sheep. He protects us from the evil one in this kingdom by guarding our hearts and our minds in the truth. But there will be no shortage of suffering in God's kingdom. Just look at John. He loses his head. The kingdom of God, here in time, of which we have been made a part, is one that lives not in the glory of the world, but rather in the cross of Christ. That is what the disciples of John struggled to see. And it is what our world cannot grasp. We are going to suffer. There will be sin in our lives. Times of tribulation and tragedy, they are going to come. But we belong to the kingdom promised through the prophets of old, proclaimed by the forerunner of the Messiah and ushered into the world in the Christ. The kingdom of God, it may not look like much to the eyes, but for those who can see its true riches and its true king, there is no other kingdom to which one can belong. For in God's kingdom we are blessed because we have the good news preached to us, And we will be raised from the dead on the last day in the resurrection of the one who has come to save us. In the name of Jesus, amen. (coughs) And now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.